Imagine a time where freedom of speech is outlawed, where education, media, books, and even thought itself is censored by the government, where the wrong opinion spoken is punishable by death. That is the society which Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans lived. Growing up in a Protestant family in Munich during World War II, the Scholl siblings became completely disillusioned with the Nazi party. So Hans, who attended the university in Munich, gathered a few like-minded students to found an underground resistance called the White Rose. They bought a typewriter and a press machine and secretly worked night and day printing and mailing tens of thousands of leaflets from undetectable locations. These leaflets made a case on behalf of the victims of the Holocaust. They exposed the genocide and they directly challenged people to shift from apathy and actively work against the Nazi regime. So great was the burden on the hearts of the Scholl siblings that by the sixth edition of the leaflet, they decided to risk their lives to take this life-saving information to all the students at the University of Munich. Sophie hid them in her suitcase, and when the students were in class, she and her brother ran throughout the building and placed the leaflets down the corridors. But they were seen. They were taken into Gestapo custody, where they were brutally interrogated for three days. Sophie's interrogation was so cruel that she appeared in court with a broken leg. When she was offered a reduced sentence if she would deny her role in creating the leaflets, she refused and insisted she be given the same sentence as her brother. On February 22nd, 1943, Hans, who was 24, and Sophie, who was only 21, were sentenced to death. Given only minutes to say goodbye to their parents, they were led to the guillotine, with Hans shouting out as his final words, long live freedom. We look at Hans and Sophie and hail them as heroes. Why? Because when the greatest evil of their time was happening, they refused to sit on the fence. They could have done nothing. They weren't the victims, but they chose to sacrifice everything for the sake of another. Are we living in a time similar to the Shoals? Could abortion be the greatest evil of our time? And are we the ones sitting on the fence? You see, whenever an injustice happens, whether we like it or not, each of us plays a role. But whether we play the right role or not is our choice. And these roles can be summed up in the following ways. The victim, the persecutor, the bystander, and the defender. Will we be remembered in our time as the persecutors or the bystanders, or will we step up and become the defenders? What I'm going to speak about is the importance of knowing why we must become like the Scholl siblings and be active defenders for the unborn, and how we are to do our job well. We will start by looking at who the victim is according to science and scripture. We're going to look at what the current situation of abortion is in the UK and how we got here. And we're going to look at effective strategies employed throughout history to end injustice. We will finish by looking at how we can apply those strategies to ending abortion today. So to begin, who is the victim? Let's start by looking at what science tells us about the beginning of human life. In his book, Developing the Human, Clinically Oriented Embryology, Keith L. Moore states the following. Human development begins at fertilization. This marked the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. A zygote is the beginning of a new human being. Science is conclusive that human life begins at the moment of fertilization. From that moment, you are a distinct, living and whole human being. The only difference between you now and the embryo you once were is your age. To provide you with more evidence of this fact, here is some real life footage taken of an embryo in the womb from six weeks from fertilization. A touch to the mouth area causes the embryo to reflexively withdraw its head. The external ear is beginning to take shape. 
By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen, along with a startle response. The four-chambered heart is largely complete. On average, the heart now beats 167 times per minute. Electrical activity of the heart, recorded at seven and a half weeks, reveals a wave pattern similar to the adults. In females, the ovaries are identifiable by seven weeks. Fingers are separate. And toes are joined only at the bases. The hands can now come together, as can the feet. Knee joints are also present. By eight weeks, 75% of embryos exhibit right hand dominance. The remainder is equally divided between left hand dominance and no preference. This is the earliest evidence of right or left handed behaviour. Head rotation, neck extension, and hand to face contact occur more often. Touching the embryo elicits squinting, jaw movement, grasping motions, and toe pointing. Between seven and eight weeks, the upper and lower eyelids rapidly grow over the eyes and partially fuse together. Although there is no air in the uterus, the embryo displays intermittent breathing motions by eight weeks. So it's clear to see the humanity of the unborn child. Now what does scripture tell us about the beginning of human life? Well in Jeremiah 1.5 we read, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Psalm 139 verse 13, For you knit me together in my mother's womb. But one of the most powerful references is in Luke 1, when Mary conceives of the Holy Spirit, she makes with haste to visit her cousin Elizabeth. But what happens when Mary enters the room? John the Baptist, his late term fetus, leaps for joy, full of the Holy Spirit. But why does he leap? He leaps in recognition of the fact that when Mary enters the room, she does not enter alone. Mary is carrying his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in the form of the very early embryo. Jesus probably hadn't even implanted inside the womb at this point. And what does Elizabeth say? Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Jesus was the saviour of the world as a very early embryo. So what does scripture say about abortion? Although scripture doesn't use the word abortion, it talks about child sacrifice. In Psalm 106, it says they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. Therefore, the Lord was angry with his people and abhorred his inheritance. God was disgusted with his people who allowed the shedding of innocent blood. But instead of us sacrificing them as they did to the gods of Canaan, today we are sacrificing our children to the gods of fear, of shame, of convenience, of pleasure. But instead of temples, we sacrifice our children in these clinics. So what is the situation of abortion in the UK? In 2018, 205,295 abortions were performed. Over 800 are carried out every working day. 39% of abortions are repeat abortions. One in three women will have an abortion before the age of 45. 
98% are funded by our taxes. And over 9 million abortions have happened in the UK since 1967. 56 million abortions happen every year worldwide. So how did we get to this place in society? When we go back in history, we see that human rights violations follow a very similar pattern. The victims are dehumanised in the language used towards them. An example of this is at the time of the Holocaust. The Jews were called pigs and rats, animalistic and subhuman terms. Caricatures were made of them, making them look obese with stacks of money and large noses. They were dressed in pyjamas. Their heads were shaved. A star was put on their arm and a number was put on their arm. And when someone becomes a number, they're very easy to delete. So how does this compare with abortion today? Our society labels the unborn child as clumps of cells, products of conception, clinical waste. The abortion industry uses euphemisms and hides behind terms like reproductive rights, healthcare, choice. The British Pregnancy Advisory Service, one of the largest abortion providers in the UK, describes abortion on their website as the termination of a pregnancy. Up to 15 weeks, the pregnancy is removed by gentle suction with local anaesthetic. So an abortion is simply the removal of a pregnancy. It's a gentle procedure. Their CEO, Anthea Rady, says, I too believe that from the time an egg is fertilised that a human life is there. And that unique life is wonderful and is marvellous. But the point for me is, it's really about who makes a decision about how that life is valued. Another way of saying this is, if I don't value that person, then they don't have value at all. When in history have we heard comments like this? So what does scripture say our response should be? It starts with mercy. In the story of John 8, Jesus gives us a perfect demonstration of stretching out his hand and loving a person and at the same time dealing with sin. He says to the woman caught in adultery, has no one condemned you? Neither do I. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, go now and leave your life of sin. In this, we see a great example of condemning an action, but not condemning a person. And we must learn to do the same and most of all, offer hope and mercy to those affected by abortion. We also have a call to rescue. In Proverbs 24, verse 11 to 12, it says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? And will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? And we must defend. Proverbs 31, eight to nine says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. In Ephesians 5.11 it says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Whenever an injustice happens, both the persecutor and the bystander want to cover it up. The defender's job is to expose it. So how do we effectively expose this injustice and apply these principles? Let's look at the history of social reform and start with the abolition of the slave trade. Many people know this figure, William Wilberforce, as the politician who tirelessly fought to put an end to the slave trade. But many aren't aware of the fact that Wilberforce was in government for decades, putting forward petition after petition, bill after bill, trying to end slavery with no success. It wasn't until he partnered with Thomas Clarkson, the activist, and the Clapham Circle that public opinion really started to shift in the nation. At the time, slavery was hidden out in the West Indies, away from the public's eye, and we reaped the benefits. You know, we got the cotton, the sugar, the rum, but we didn't see that it was bought on the blood and the bags of slaves. Clarkson recognised so long as slavery was hidden and covered up from society, it would survive and thrive. So he took six months and travelled around the country on horseback to expose slavery through the use of visual imagery and props. He took images like this one, Am I not a man and a brother? to rehumanise the slave that had been so dehumanised. He showed images like this, where slaves were branded as property 
and like this, where slaves were savagely killed. This iconic image of the slave ship Brooks showed humans packed like sardines. The image was put in pubs and in people's homes and flyers and newspapers to horrify people about the reality of the slave trade. And public opinion began to shift and immense pressure was put on Parliament until finally the law changed and slavery was abolished. So we learned that in order to change policy, you must work to change public opinion. Moving on to 1955, I want to share the story of Emmett Till with you. Emmett was really the catalyst for the civil rights movement. At 14 years old, he whistled at a white woman in Mississippi and said something like, hey babe. Four days later, the woman's husband and half-brother kidnapped Till from his uncle's house. They beat him, mutilated his body, they shot him in the head and used barbed wire to tie him to a cotton gin fan and dispose of his body in the river. His body was discovered three days later, unidentifiable, but for a ring on his finger that his mother had given him the day before he left Chicago. Till's body was shipped back up to Chicago, and when Emmett's mother went to see him, the man in charge of the funeral home refused to open the coffin, having been given orders by the Mississippi authorities that no one could see the body. Emmett's mother demanded he open it, saying, if you don't open the casket, I will open it myself. Let me see my son. And so it was opened, and she saw her son's mutilated form. His tongue had been choked out of his mouth. His nose looked like a meat chopper had been taken to it. One of his eyes was lying on his cheek, and she could see the bullet hole in his head. Mamie Till decided to have an open casket funeral with Emmett's body on display for five days. 50,000 people lined the streets of Chicago to see his body and parents took their children up to the coffin so that they would see the reality of racism and be a part of the movement which would fight to end it. Media through sources like Jet Magazine published this photograph of Emmett's face and word began to spread very quickly about what had happened to the boy who simply whistled at a white woman. This graphic image of Till's body occurred 100 days before the Rosa Parks incident. And Rosa Parks said she stayed seated on the bus because she was thinking on injustices like that which was inflicted upon Emmett Till and decided enough was enough. And Rosa Parks' demonstration stirred Martin Luther King to launch the bold civil rights movement. You see, for years, thousands of black men and women had been lynched, but this was the first time that a body had been nationally displayed. And because the bravery of Emmett's mother and the graphic image of her dead son, the civil rights movement was born. Martin Luther King Jr. also recognised the power of exposing an injustice to move the heart of a nation to action. He said America will not reject racism until America sees racism. He used images like these to shame America before the world. And the media would take these images and expose them to the public. And when they got into the newspapers and the television, these images worked to move those good-hearted white people who were on the fence off the fence on the issue of civil rights. And the dramatic shift in public opinion by exposing the injustice put immense pressure on the government to change policy. There is no better way of summing it up than in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. himself. Like a boil that can never be cured, so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. The last social reform movement I'm going to share with you is about the fight against child labour. Lewis Hine was hired by a group in 1908 who wanted to end child labour and his job was to travel around the country to places like the mines of Pennsylvania, taking pictures of children working long hours in dangerous conditions. And as these pictures were distributed to the public, they became so uncomfortable with child labour that by 1920 the number of child labourers was cut in half from what it had been in 1910. 
So the lessons that we can learn are the following. In order to change policy, we must first change public opinion. No social reformer has ever ended an injustice by covering it up. And change rarely occurs unless the cost of maintaining the status quo becomes unbearable. What the pro-life movement needs to cause is a radical behavioural change in society. But we can't change how people behave until we first change how they feel about an injustice. Let's look at how these principles have been applied in modern day. In a public statement on the 3rd of September 2015, the Prime Minister David Cameron said, we can take no more refugees as it's not the answer to problems in the war-torn Middle East. Within 24 hours of that statement, Cameron opened the doors to thousands of refugees. What caused this drastic change in position? It was this image of a dead Syrian baby. This image spread like wildfire on social media and Cameron saw this image and said he was deeply moved, so changed policy. In order to change how people behave, we need to change how they feel. Even in the UK, the government uses strategies of showing graphic images to warn people of the terrible risks of smoking. This strategy has worked to save lives. Over a period of 40 years, the number of smokers in the UK reduced from 46% in 1974 to 19% in 2014. In order to change how people behave, we need to change how they feel. When we see the reality of poverty in other countries, we give millions as our hearts are stirred by pictures like these, which have raised over a billion pounds in the last 30 years for comic relief. In order to change how people behave, we need to change how they feel. Would we understand the Holocaust from this image of a happy Jewish boy at his bar mitzvah? Sure, we see the humanity of this boy, but it's not until we see an image like this that we say the Holocaust was such an evil, it can never happen again. A question some may ask is, would Jesus use bloody pictures to make his point? He already did. Jesus chose a very public and brutal death on the busiest day of the Jewish calendar where parents were out with their children to display his bloody body. And it's when we see his body that we not only understand the depth of our sin, but the depth of his love for us. So from this, we've seen throughout history and even modern day that in order to change how people behave when it comes to moving from apathy to fighting injustice, we need to change how they feel about an issue. And the same can be said about abortion. We will never truly understand the horror of abortion until we see it. In the words of Greg Cunningham, some acts are so horrific that words fail us when we try to convey their true horror. What I'm going to do is play a video for you which Mary Stopes, a major UK abortion provider, use as a tool to promote their abortion services. What we have inserted is the part of the procedure that they have intentionally left out, the abortion. By showing this, I want to make it clear that I'm not condemning the acts of abortion, but the act involved. I believe we can sum it up like this. We're not the victims, the babies are and their story has a right to be told exactly as it happened.
In the words of Greg Cunningham, injustice that remains invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. Our society and many of our churches are tolerating what we just saw precisely because it is invisible, because it's hidden behind the closed doors of abortion clinics and behind euphemisms like freedom, choice and women's rights. But the reverse of that is also true. Injustice that's made visible becomes intolerable. We have a responsibility to tell others. So we must apply this strategy. This leads me to the work of CBR UK. We were established to put the principles of the history of social reform into practice. Our mission is to educate on the humanity of the unborn child and the reality of abortion in order to make abortion unthinkable. We do this in a number of ways, through the Clarkson Academy, a training academy providing conferences and online courses to equip people to become effective ambassadors for the unborn child. Through Brefos, a project set up to equip church leaders to address abortion in their congregations and help the church actively speak out for the unborn. Through PACE, post-abortion support for everyone, helping to build support networks for men and women who have been through abortion and bring them to a place of healing and restoration. Through presentations into schools where we teach on human value and in secondary school educate on the reality of abortion as well. And through our public education displays which takes the principles from social reform history and puts them into action on the streets. When we do these displays we unveil the injustice of abortion with abortion victim photography. We confront the culture and we accept the persecution. As we confront the culture, we devise our own methods of reaching the masses. We use large banners like these ones to show the humanity of the unborn child and expose abortion. Like all social reform movements, injustice has to be exposed in order for it to be ended. We don't protest abortion, but abortion when we show it protests itself. And when we take this to the public, people start to engage both on the streets, where we may reach a few thousand people, and online, where we reach many thousands more. This display alone reached more than 100,000 people in one day on Facebook. And when we take to the streets, media attention is also drawn to our presence because the strategy is bold enough to gain interest. And this expands our audience size and gives us a platform to advocate on behalf of the unborn. Our goal is to get as many people as possible seeing the reality of abortion with as little manpower as possible. This is just one of many examples of the media broadcasting our displays and exposing abortion for us. And through showing the reality, lives are saved. This is just one story that made it to the front page of BBC Newsbeat. This mother decided to keep her baby after speaking with one of our volunteers in Brighton outside of a clinic and seeing the reality of abortion. And this is her baby, Miracle. Another young lady met one of our volunteers at Brixton and saw the abortion victim images when coming back to the clinic to take the second abortion pill. She changed her mind and despite fear of harm already being done to the baby, her miracle baby was born healthy. This is another baby who was saved from abortion after her parents saw the reality outside the clinic. And this is her today. This is from a girl who saw the images online. I am pregnant and people including the father wants me to have one. After watching these pictures, I refuse to. It is as simple as this. If we weren't using the pictures, these babies would have been killed. So does showing abortion change minds instantly on the street? In this next video, we ask the public what they think about abortion and then show them its reality. What do you think about abortion? Each individual, it's up to them what they want to do. I think everybody should be allowed the right. Eh? I'm not really for it or against it. So everyone has their right to kind of do what they feel is right in their own life. So what I want to show you now is a short one minute video of what an abortion procedure looks like at various stages from 10 to 24 weeks. Oh. That baby is too big to be doing now. Oh, allow it. Sorry, I don't think I can do it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't okay. look at it. Sorry. So that's the video. 
That was uh, These babies were pretty small. They were saying it felt like it was. They had hands. I didn't know it was like that. That's a, that's a body. That's a she. That's it's a full, not a full grown, but that's a. It's fully developed. That shouldn't. That really shouldn't be right. That's technically. Even though the baby may not be out, that's technically. I will relate that to murder. I don't think they should be cutting up babies like that. Nah. Oh, I'm a bit speechless actually. It is a person and people don't realise that a lot of people think, oh it's just a bunch of cells and that. To a point, but you know, three months and on you can really see the formation and everything, so yeah. <laughs> The images work, the strategy works, it's proven through history and we are seeing the fruits of it today. Public opinion is shifting. So this brings us to the question, what can you do about it? To start, sign up to receive our newsletters and follow us on social media and then share the facts. We all have friends and family who may not know the facts surrounding abortion. Be the person to inform them. Join a team displays the most effective and necessary way of shifting public opinion. The more teams that start, the more the education happens, the sooner abortion can be brought to an end. Train with us. Apply for our online courses to get confident as an educator to learn how to set up a team or to present the pro-life message to your contacts. And book your place at our next conference. Invite a speaker. We have a team of highly trained communicators who can speak, debate or present on this issue at your event. Wherever it is, let's make it happen. And donate. There are hundreds of millions of pounds being used to finance the abortion industry every year. To turn this tide, we need people to be as serious about financing the end of it as they are about financing the advancement of it. The work of CBR UK relies solely on the generosity of individuals who support our work. Every donation enables us to reach more people with the facts about abortion, to challenge people's thinking and to save lives. If you believe in the logic of what we're proposing, then partner with us so that together we can continue to work effectively to defend the unborn and save them from abortion. And join our prayer team. Whether that's joining our prayer calls, receiving our prayer newsletter, joining our WhatsApp group. If you have a heart for intercession, then join us as we intercede for the end of abortion. As you can see, there is so much that needs to be done, but this is a winnable battle. If we work together to unveil the injustice of abortion, to confront the culture, and if we accept the persecution that comes with it, we will see an end to abortion. As I conclude, I want us to think back on the story of Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans. Soon after they were killed, the story of their sacrifice and the sixth edition of their leaflet reached the British shores. And less than one year later, millions of copies of this leaflet were printed and dropped by Allied planes over Germany. They now bore the title, A German Leaflet, Manifesto of the Students of Munich. Today, over 200 schools are named after the Scholls. Their names are honoured on buildings and memorials throughout Germany. The legacy of their sacrifice and courage lives on. I want to finish by reading Sophie Scholl's final words before she was executed. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually for a righteous cause? Such a fine and sunny day and I have to go, but what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? Sophie lays a powerful challenge to us today. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give themselves up for the sake of the unborn? What does our reputation, our time, our resources, and even our very lives matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? Mm -hmm.